the Big History Action Pack. Hi there and welcome to the Big History Action Pack. I've come to Dover Castle to introduce the programme. Dover just at the bottom right hand corner of England. OK, now here's just a taste of what's to come. Growing fly traps Darwin style. Tough tests for kit from the past. Tudor scoff in our cookery corner, along with horses for courses, gunpowder and stacks more of England's amazing history. The Big History Action Pack. But first, the site here at Dover Castle has protected this part of England's coastline, the nearest point to Europe, for over 2,000 years. A real landmark in history. So what better excuse to take a bit of a tour of England's historical landscape? Here's your ticket to ride. At first, people made their way from place to place on foot. If you needed to go somewhere, you just stood up and started walking. Then came horses, more about them later. Long afterwards were roads, rail and canals. Janet Gershlik picks up the story. As far as I'm concerned, nothing beats stopping at home, feet up, moggy on my lap, good programme on the TV and a packet of salt and vinegar. But no one can do that all the time. Far from staying at home, people have always been on the move, carving tracks across England as they went. But how do you find out where people used to go in the past and where the tracks ran? With one of these, a map. This one shows England's Roman roads. I got it from the Ordnance Survey people. I'll tell you more about that later. But this was originally a Roman road. Real history, right under my feet. I've never thought of old maps as history books before, but it is amazing what you find out when you look at them. Tracks turn into roads, bridges cut across rivers for shortcuts, and even waterways get fiddled with to make it easier for boats to get by. And then there's the railways, the age of steam. Nowadays, we zip from place to place by car, but over 100 years ago, hardly anybody owned a car. For serious journeys, they went by train, the steam train. In England, steam trains may not have lasted that long, but boy, did they change the landscape. History in motion, locomotion. Now this is the Royal Scot. In the 1930s, it whooshed up to Glasgow from London at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. It must have been the fastest thing on 16 wheels. So an old railway map can tell you tons about where it was important and what went on in the years when the train was king of the road. Roads, rails and waterways, historical tracks across the landscape recorded on old maps. So to put my map's idea to the test, I borrowed a helicopter for the morning. Yes, a helicopter. It's time to have a quick look at the bottom right-hand corner of England from the air and find out what history I can spot mapped out below me. Wish me luck, because I can't stand heights. The A to Z of English history. A is for archery. The bow and arrow was one of the first weapons used in battle. Until the development of gunpowder around 700 years ago, bowmen were a powerful force in any English army. What's a history teacher's favourite fruit? Dates. <laughs> B is for Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain was a crucial British victory in World War II. Control of the air over Britain prevented a German invasion. British fighter aircraft destroyed 1,733 German planes, compared with 915 British losses. Churchill said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Now, I'm a bit of a history hoarder myself. True. I'm not quite sure where I put this stone-throwing catapult, but when it comes to collecting, you could do a lot worse than take a few tips from our man in the museum, Lloyd Grossman.
Museums are a bit like our attics at home. They're places to keep things. But that's not the whole story because unlike your granny's cupboard, for example, museums aren't stuffed with just any old thing. Museums are sets of individual collections, collections that are built around themes. Now the theme of this gallery is natural history, and someone's thought very carefully about what's in here and what they want to tell us about it. So why do people feel the need to collect? Is it because we love finding out about things, or are we just like squirrels? My name is James and I collect stamps and here are some of the stamps I have collected which are from Canada. I collect empty ink cartridges. I get them from my school fountain pen and my friends who use them as well, um, they give them to me afterwards. That cost £1 for a whole pack. We've got exactly 368 horses. My favourite one is um, Polly. Um, we collect them different mates. Uh, just an individual one can cost up to about £3 to £4. I'll carry on collecting them and then perhaps I can get lots of different shapes and sizes. Maybe make something out of them or something. I think I'll go on collecting them until I'm a teenager. Oh yes, you see, but they've all been collecting for a long time and isn't it awfully expensive to start a worthwhile collection? Well, not really, especially if you concentrate on collecting just one thing. My choice for today? Combs. You know, what you comb your hair with. And today's challenge to see how many different combs I can collect from the area around this museum in the next hour or so. The idea of making this particular collection came from seeing bone combs in the museum Saxon Gallery. Of course, I'm not expecting to find anything antique today, but what's new one day doesn't take more than a year or two to become something from the past. And you know what? That's how collections often get started. In just an hour and 27 minutes, I've amassed this little lot, and what a fine collection it is. There are combs for thick hair, combs for thin, a comb for a bride, and a comb with a nice little message. When I'm next recycled, I want to be a soap dish. Just imagine the interesting combs I could collect if I were given a year or two. Now, do private collections ever become part of museum collections? You bet they do. You're looking at a collection of everyday objects and toys from India, put together by one person. Here's a group of oil lamps. They're mostly made from recycled tin plate and old cans. These are miniatures, tiny versions of household objects, a bit like doll's house furniture. And the theme of this part of the collection is transport. Cars, buses, trucks, and tractors. So what are you waiting for? Get along to your local museum for some ideas about what to collect and start collecting. The big, 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 mm, big history action pack. <laughs> what did the weatherman say to the Roman emperor? Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar. <laughs> the A to Z of English history. C is for church. Just over a thousand years ago, St Augustine came to England from Rome to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. D is for Doomsday Book. The Doomsday Book was the first complete survey of most of England, put together nearly a thousand years ago for William the Conqueror. It tells us who owned the land and who did what jobs. Which books do snakes like? History books! <laughs> you might have heard people say your home is your castle, but I say make room for a few four-legged friends. After all, they'll never let you down. Pets in the past. 
What's the quickest way of getting about in England? Ferrari? Intercity train? High-speed jet? Whatever you choose, I bet you wouldn't think of including the horse. But 200 years ago, our cross-country rapid transport system had four legs, a mane and a tail. And you might as well have said, four legs are faster than two. So, now that the horse is nearly a national pet, how come we've forgotten how important Dobbin, Neddy and all the rest used to be? When the Romans invaded England around 2,000 years ago, their mounted cavalry played a huge part in conquering the country. And until the beginning of this century, war horses were a major feature of our battlefields. And we've pretty much taken the horse for granted in peacetime as well. For hundreds of years, horses were the original farm tractor, hauling plows, heaving loads, pulling carts. In cities, taxis, trams and even delivery trucks were all horse-drawn. Not surprising then that yesterday's Intercity Express was a stagecoach driven by horsepower. So that's the horse. But hang on a minute, if this really is Pets on Parade, who else should be taking a bow? I knew it! The nation's favourite little friend. Skinny pooch, sporty pooch, scary pooch, whichever you prefer, in the past dogs have been a whole lot more than just our best friend. You probably know about dogs as hunters, but did you know about them as milkmen, rat catchers and soldiers? In the past, we relied on dogs to help us out in all sorts of situations and probably worked them much too hard. So next time you're out walking with Fido or Fred, or just lounging around watching the horse racing on TV, mind your manners and say a little thank you to a couple of pets who've been a whole lot more important than you could ever imagine. And remember, four legs might just be better than two. E is for electricity. For thousands of years, people used oil lamps and candles in their houses. In 1880, electric light bulbs were invented. Today, we take electricity for granted. Shocking, I call it. I thought it was about time I made a quick change. Believe it or not, if you worked the guns in the 16th century, then you might have worn an outfit just like this. Very smart. Trousers are a bit itchy, though. And if you think that this outfit is cool, then just check out this little lot. Yes, it's clothesline. Where we are cruel to kit you would have worn in England hundreds of years ago. Tough tests for top historical outfits from the past. Raring to go. First up, James. The date, 100 AD, Roman Britain. James's choice, basic Roman woolen tunic, matching leggings and leather sandals. And next, Nell. She's chosen something medieval. Full-length tunic-style dress made in wool with a soft linen undergarment. And this is Jake, trussed up in Tudor togs, complete with fine knitted hose. That's tights to you and me. And finally, Alice, long-waisted, quite stiff dress made of heavy wool with stacks of underlayers to bulk it out. Well, those are the clothes, and now these are the tests. First, Transport. And that's why we've signed up Ginge, a top-notch pony to take each of our testers for a quick trot. It was really uncomfortable. It was really hard to move. And they're really heavy as well. Jake's Tudor jacket, called a doublet, and his trousers, called breeches, are made in velvet. And they're stuffed with horse hair. Sorry about that, Ginge. They're nice and soft, and I like them like that. It's just that they don't really look very stylish or anything. This doesn't stop your leg room, so you've still got quite a leg, lot of leg room, but halfway through the ride, if you're riding on a horse, the shoes would fall off for definite. They keep coming loose. I got on the gins and his head kept going down. So I pulled his head up, and then my skirt got caught up on the saddle. And finally, it was OK. No particular problems. All the clothes passed the ride test, which is more than can be said for the horse. It kind of liked the grass, I think. Next on clothesline, recreation. 
we took our testers to the local snooker club and queued up Roman James and Restoration Alice for their big break. You can move quite freely. The short sleeves let you let your arms move around in any position. The legs you can walk. Except when you bend down a bit, the belt can dig in a bit. When we moved around in these, it was okay. It was better than the horse riding anyway. Because you didn't trip over them and things. Because of its multiple layers and cramped cut, Alice's 1666 outfit looks heavy, hot and uncomfortable by today's standards. Meanwhile, next door in the church hall, Jake in his Tudor togs and Nell in her medieval kit were up to a bit of badminton. Which is probably why they're making such a uh, racket. You can't breathe very easily in it and like when you're running around you get out of breath so it's more difficult and it's tight and stuff and this rough doesn't help but it's all itchy and that's something you don't really need. It's much harder to play in this. It's just really difficult because you have to lift it up and then run and so you might just miss the ball and you can trip over. And so to the home cooking test. We booked a table at the top local restaurant to see what happens when our testers sit down to a touch of the Italian, spaghetti bolognese and a glass or two of tap water. When you scooped up it was okay and as long as you checked it wasn't going on you and if it was just wipe it away and it's gone. At the end of the day, tough tests for our kits from the past on clothesline. But to sum up, which outfits do the testers rate as the best of the bunch? Yeah, Alice is the grey. If my rough if, was a little bit if, better, that no, might be nice, if, um, rough is if Alice's not very was good, more think. colourful than grey, yeah, yeah, then I think it would be nice. Because usually in those times it would have been a lot So, which of the outfits would you choose? Keep watching and make your pick as they go through the screen again. Roman Britain, 100 AD. Medieval, 1154. Tudor, 1590. Restoration, 1665. I prefer a nice tracksuit myself. The A to Z of English history. F is for flint. 6,000 years ago, before the discovery of metal, people made axes, arrowheads and knives from flint and even used it to strike the sparks that lit their fires. Where was the Magna Carta signed? On the bottom of the page. <laughs> G is for gunpowder. In 1346, at the Battle of Cressy, the English used guns for the very first time. By 1642, the start of England's civil war, many soldiers carried their own muskets. Stuffed with gunpowder, fired by a smouldering fuse, they could easily blow up in your face. H is for Hastings. The Battle of Hastings in 1066 was the victory of William the Conqueror and his Normans over King Harold and the Saxons. The Bayer Tapestry in France tells the whole story of the Norman invasion in pictures. The Big History Action Pack. Now I'm at another little corner of Dover Castle. About 300 years ago, a tunnel was dug through the chalk to make a speedy link for English troops to whiz their way up from Dover Harbour down there to the castle where I am now. It was a huge earth-moving operation. A bit of a contrast to the worms that Charles Darwin studied just nearby at Down House. Dig this. About 150 years ago, the building behind me was home to one of Britain's most controversial scientists. Who was he? Charles Darwin. Born in 1809, he lived here with his family for the last 40 years of his life. He published a famous book which got people thinking completely differently about life on Earth. It was called On the Origin of Species. Now, Charles Darwin undertook a huge scientific program, carefully observing and recording the natural world around him and publishing a whole series of books. But the last book he wrote was called The Formation of Vegetable Moulds Through the Action of Worms with Observations on Their Habits. We're talking worm watch.
Now what Darwin noticed is that worms bring to the surface little heaps of fine soil, these worm casts. Now he calculated that where worms are most active, they can add up to half a centimetre of soil cover to the ground each year. But how could he test his theories? Well actually it was his son Horace who invented this worm stone around these rods as a static reference point and then he went on to invent a special measuring device. There's a replica in the exhibition here at Down House. In fact, Darwin came to realise that we may have been overlooking the significance of worms. He even wrote in his book, Worms have played a more important part in the history of the world than most persons would at first suppose. And now, the big history guide to plants which eat meat. Now these are many of the sorts of carnivorous plants that Darwin studied in this greenhouse. All of these plants, although they come from all over the world, share common features amongst their habitat. That is to say, they all grow in boggy regions where there's very low nutrients in the soil. And by eating flies and other insects, they actually supplement their diet. <laughs> The trap on a Venus flytrap closes in two phases, and Darwin noticed this, and he was the first to work out why it does this. It has little trigger hairs inside the trap, and if you trip one of these hairs once, the trap won't close, but if you trip it two or three times within a certain space of time, as a fly would if it were moving about inside rather than just something brushing through once, that'll trigger the trap. So if I, if I knock these hairs just the once, nothing happens, but if I do it twice, in the right space of time, bang. The amazing thing about these plants is they're really not that difficult to grow. Let me show you how. Well, first of all, at my local garden centre, I bought this trough. The important thing about this is that it's watertight, has no holes in the bottom and will hold water. It's cost about 350. I've got some pebbles, which cost me nothing. I've got sphagnum moss, which is very water retentive, and you can buy it in your garden centre. A bag of about that much, cost around three pounds. And of course, most importantly, the plants. Now, where do you get these? Well, you can find them in your garden centre. I've seen this South African sundew and the Venus flytrap for around three pounds each. Uh, but to be honest, I would recommend looking in a specialist nursery. So, how do we put the thing together? It's really quite simple. Pebbles in, <laughs> pebbles in the bottom. Now you fill this up with water. Now, as you'll know by now, one of the important features of the habitats of these plants is that they grow in boggy areas, so they're, they're quite waterlogged. So you don't fill the trough up to the top. You fill it up about halfway, so the bottom of the pots is sitting in just a little water. And then you arrange your plants. It's all to your taste, really, all to your personal taste. But having done that, what we do now is add the sphagnum moss. And we tuck that in and around the pots. Now, this will help to retain the moisture all around the plants. And as the water evaporates up, it'll keep the air around the plants a little more humid than it would if it didn't have it. And by the time we've finished, what you're going to have is the appearance of plants growing in their natural habitat. One of the very important things about looking after all carnivorous plants is that you must never, ever water them with tap water. If you do, you'll kill them, for sure. Because tap water nearly always contains calcium. Rainwater only, never tap water. So how are you going to collect your rainwater? Well, you can use one of these, which is a rainwater diverter. Costs 13 quid, it's quite expensive, but it's a great system. It diverts water from the downspout, from your guttering, into a water butt or a bucket or whatever you want. But if that's too much to spend for you, you can always put a bucket out when it's raining, collect the water, and just store it in one of these five-litre water bottles, and it keeps in there, as far as I know, pretty much indefinitely. The next thing is feeding. 
Now, never ever feed them with an, a regular type plant food because that, as, as with watering the tap water, that will kill them slowly also. What you can do is just, just leave them to catch the flies. In the summer when there's a lot of flies, they'll do brilliantly. Honestly, they will, you'll be surprised how well they do with catching flies. But earlier on in the season, when they're not getting so much to eat, when the flies aren't so busy, you can feed them, well, Charles Darwin used to give them a bit of steak, which is, seems to me quite generous. But on my budget, I give them a little bit of cheese. I found they like e down. If you fancy visiting Down House, give English Heritage a call to find out when it's open. And if you're thinking of buying yourself some fly traps, the Royal Horticultural Society's Plant Finder book can tell you exactly where to get them. More information and some useful website addresses in the Big History booklet. The Big History Action Pack. The A to Z of English history. I is for inns. Some of the old buildings we call pubs today were originally roadside inns. By law, inns had to provide food, drink and somewhere to sleep for travellers who were journeying on foot, horse or by carriage. Some inns still have their original stable yards. J is for jury. Juries have been a feature of English courts for about 800 years. But it's possible that Vikings brought the idea of juries with them from Scandinavia much earlier. Coming up on Big History, frogs, fox tongues and some nasty medieval medicine, making a mark for the next generation, and will our cooks beat their deadline on the Tudor taste trail? The Big History Action Pack. Welcome to the wonderful world of Freya and Eric. They can walk, they can run. Freya can set sail in her very own radio-controlled longboat. Turn Eric's special key and marvel as he recites his Viking sagas. And they can cope with family feuds together. The wonderful, wonderful world of Freya and Eric. Only available from Toys and Nath. Imagine an olive oil, silky smooth. So versatile it can be used for cooking, cleansing and lighting. An oil rich in the natural ingredients of the Mediterranean. Flaminius olive oil, the oil of life. Unwin and Indigo, family blacksmiths who make it all. Spears, swords, large or small, even repairs. Unwin and Indigo. Contact you and I, blacksmiths, for a quote on all your metalwork. Because you know we can make it. You and I, the family blacksmiths. The Right beneath where I'm standing, Dover Castle has three miles of secret tunnels, last used as military headquarters during the Second World War. How do we know? Well, we have black and white photographs to prove it. Every picture tells a story, if you know how to read it. Take a look at this. The Big History Guide to Reading Old Photographs. Number one, look at the background and ask yourself, where exactly was this photograph taken? If it's an outdoor shot, what sort of location? For indoor pictures, what sort of room? Next, look at people's clothes. What's different from things we wear today? Add in a bit of help from books on the history of clothes and some dates might just start to fall into place. Third, at what time of year was the photograph taken and when in the day? Plants and trees in the background give clues and so do shadows on the ground or people squinting into the sun. And are they wearing winter or summer clothes? It might seem obvious, but what are the people in the photograph doing? Or more to the point, what does the photographer want us to see? Is this a special occasion, a set pose, or is it just everyday life? Final challenge. Who are these people? Where do they come from? Are they rich or hard up? Cheerful 
or sad? How do they feel? But you don't have to dig out really old black and white photographs like the ones we've been reading. Try reading pictures taken just a few years back. And remember, full colour's as good as black and white. So why not get started with a few snaps of family and friends? Hear about the Roman senator who covered himself in gold. He had a guilt complex. <laughs> the A to Z of English history. K is for kings. Charles I of England was beheaded in 1649, and England was a republic without a monarch for nearly 12 years, until the restoration of King Charles II in 1660. L is for London. In 1666, three quarters of London was razed to the ground by a great fire. It started in a baker's shop and burned for days, destroying 13,000 houses and 9,000 churches. But remarkably, only 20 people died in the blaze. My great-great-great-grandfather died at Waterloo. I don't know which platform. <laughs> <laughs> the big history action pack! This is weird. I'm half a mile beneath the castle in an operations room used to control some of the battles during World War II. This is the hotline, a direct telephone to maybe the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. Being in here is a bit like being in a time capsule, everything perfectly preserved by English heritage. But how do you decide what to preserve and show the next generation? Here's our big history team with a few ideas. Now, I love the idea of a time capsule containing things that maybe aliens will find in a thousand years' time. But today, we're going to bury a time capsule for the next generation. The next generation is our children. The next generation is like our children, and then our children's children, and then the children's children's children. It's time for tip number one. First, decide what type of time capsule you want to bury. Our time capsule is about what it is like to live in today's society. In the future, people would um, want to know what um, their history was like, like we want to know what our history was like today. Tip two. Next, decide what you want to put in it. Think about what it's like to live now and what will people in the future want to know about today. Well, I've brought some photos to show my house. OK. And what it was like. I've brought a book to show what my interests were and what I enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. And a computer game to show what I enjoyed doing. And also a bit of money. Yeah, too, because the currency might have changed in a few years. So. Include your favourite things or photos of them. Don't put anything in it that you need to keep for yourself. Well, I could like, take a picture of them and then put the picture in. I would still show them what they look like. A newspaper or a local magazine also makes good reading. You could even make things specially for it. Tip three. But there are some things you shouldn't include. Well, you couldn't put in wood, any wooden things like wooden toys, because that would rot over time. And you couldn't put in live animals because they'll just die and they'll leave a horrible smell. OK, Andrew, out of these three things, what would you not put in your time capsule? I, I wouldn't put in the, the burger and chips because, they'd, because they wouldn't last. Burgers and chips, not a good idea. Here comes tip four. Now, once you've got your bits and pieces together, you've got to decide what you want to bury it in. This ice cream container, for example, isn't a bad idea. Well, I'll bury it in this tin because it, I hope it will hold it for quite a long time. Well, something that could keep the weather out and, like, keep it preserved. Make sure it's well sealed. 
I'd put it in a metal box and I'd put some sort of strong material around the box because then it would stop animals from getting in and other things from getting in. Tip five. Don't forget to write a date on it so people know when it was buried. Tip number six. Stickers may fall off or get lost, so it's a good idea to use a permanent marker pen. Tip seven. Now, the only thing left to do is to bury it, but where? So it won't be very hard to dig. You could bury it in your garden, or like us, ask your school. You needn't bury too deep, or it will never get found. I think about one metre should do it. Some people expect them to be underground for hundreds of years, but we hope ours will be found in about 20. So there you have it. It hasn't taken long for us to put our time capsule together. So maybe you'd like to try it for yourself, for future generations to find and open and to discover what life was like today. Top time capsule tips. Decide what it's about. Fill it with around 10 things. Seal and mark it well. Bury it a metre deep. The big act. Action um, history pack. <laughs> M is for monasteries. Monasteries were buildings giving shelter to communities of men or women who vowed to live together worshipping God. Monasteries had great libraries and made copies of books sometimes beautifully decorated. A to Z of English history. <laughs> N is for navigation. English navigators used a compass and a chronometer to map the oceans. Navigation was also the name given to the early canals and waterways which crisscrossed England. The men digging the canals were called navvies, which were short for navigators. <laughs> Why weren't they called gators? If you can't stand the sight of blood, then close your eyes right now because I'm in an underground hospital where they treated wounded soldiers during World War II. Now, the instruments here, these are all real, but the bandages and the blood, thankfully, is fake. But if you think this looks a bit rough, believe me, it's nothing compared to medieval medicine. Medieval medicine would be considered today to be somewhat barbaric. But the medieval physician was as good as the knowledge that was around at the time. To compare healthcare now with what happened 800 years ago, we got together an expert reenactor to be surgeon Sir Ralph of Epperstone from the year 1210 and Dr. Heidi Tempest, a real doctor from today who works in a big city hospital. We don't tend to get arrow wounds these days unless it's for sport. They argued about the best cure for a headache. Which you actually put into your mouth, you swallow it, goes into your stomach, and you absorb it. The method I would use to cure a headache. So Ralph suggested collecting plantain. Go out before dawn with a wooden bladed knife, it must be wood, and dig out the plant in its entirety. I would cut off the root, and when the patient with the headache was coming to me, I would take a red ribbon, because red is a magical colour. When the patient with the headache came to me, I would take the root and I would tie the root to the patient's forehead, and the healing properties of the root go into Would the head Dr. Tempest the agree head. with what she saw? I think the only reason how he may have seen people actually get better was probably just because they were going to see him and they were pleased and they thought, as long as people thought it was going to work, it may have, may have, the head it may have gone anyway. They have analysed plantain and found it's antibiotic and antiseptic. So there is a possibility that it could have done some good. It wouldn't be absorbed, it wouldn't go, it just, it wouldn't go anywhere. This is a dental treatment. Lots of medicine relied on you believing it would work, whether it did or not. If you're suffering from a loose tooth, take the live frog and strap it to your jaw. <laughs> that will firm your teeth up. Right, I think that's very different from today. Well, I'm not dealing with teeth myself, um, because that's more of the dentist, so that shows that we've got different roles these days and we're a lot more specialised. Um, 
but the frog attached to the, the jaw. 800 years ago, dentists and doctors were one and the same person. I put in here a charcoal and a probe. I put the probe into the charcoal until it is red hot, and then I apply it to the patient's gum, and the heat will sear the gum and stop the patient's gum from bleeding. So, did they keep their surgical instruments clean? I don't think they understood the concepts of bacteria causing infections. We did believe at that time that cleanliness of equipment was necessary. If anything, they did, they did encourage infection. We would uh, wash bandages at least once between uses. I was expecting him to have, have put the metal objects into a flame, even to sort of to sterilise them, but he didn't. We would keep our instruments as clean as possible, though they would probably have just been washed out in a bucket of water. And everything looked so filthy. But we did actually believe that cleanliness was important. And what's in this red bag? This is a treatment for something called the cataract. Cataracts are an eye problem. I go out into the forest, capture a live fox, cut out his tongue and release him. The tongue is then dried, put into a red velvet bag and hung around the patient's neck. And it says it's that. Was Dr Tempest convinced? No. I just don't see how that would work at all. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere near the eye. Um, it just hangs around your neck. It's more, I would think, more magical than medical. Ridiculous. What's that strange instrument you have around your neck? You write this? Yeah. Oh, this is a stethoscope. We use these today for actually listening to people's hearts and lungs, but we don't uh, do it through all that amount of clothing. It seems a very, very strange thing to me. It seems like a tool of the devil. It's very useful, actually, for helping us to decide what's wrong with people. Our knowledge of the workings of the body was very sparse. We really didn't quite know how the body worked. Um, ideas were put forward, many of which were wrong, but again, you've got to start somewhere. If he was well, he would be bled to keep him well. Uh, in the monasteries, the monks are usually bled twice a year um, for the good of their health. The main thing without proper anaesthetics or painkillers was to do surgery very quickly. The idea is if you take more than about four and a half minutes to do a, an operation, your patient goes into shock but the sign of a good surgeon was one who could work very, very fast. It was sort of no pain, no gain in his day, really. Um, whereas now, we don't like pain at all. We don't want people to be scared of doctors. Um, we like to keep everything as pain-free as possible. We could not dull pain. And we believe, or as a church taught us, that God had sent pain and pestilence and suffering to punish man for his wickedness. I'm not saying that there's never pain because, you know, sometimes there is small amounts, but we try and keep away from it as much as possible. And that's why we put people to sleep um, and give anaesthetics and try and do as much pain-free things as we can. So would you have risked a doctor's visit 800 years ago? The Big History Action Pack. The A to Z of English history. O is for oak. English timber-framed houses were made from oak. Oak trees were key features in the landscape parks of Greek country houses. P is for potato. Spuds popped up in England 400 years ago, but contrary to the popular story, it wasn't Sir Walter Raleigh who introduced them. There you are, another legend mashed. <laughs> the underground kitchen. Time now for a bit of lunch. Well, perhaps not. But it is time for Table Talk. Not bad. Table Talk, Big History's own cookery corner, where we get to taste the popular dishes of our previous century. And here's how it works. We set a present-day family the challenge of cooking a recipe they've never seen before. On today's menu is Tudor food, with a recipe that's 400 years old and a family that's willing to cook it up. And here's Dave. So, I've come to Kenilworth, which is near Coventry, for today's little challenge. Ooh, yeah. Taking part in the challenge is the Cooper family. And they're already clearing up for the big cooking. Hello, I'm Abby and I'm seven. I'm Matthew and I'm eight. 
I'm Sue, and I'm their mum, and I'm not telling you how old I am. Abby says she's not that keen on history, but we'll soon see. Matt, he prefers the name Matt, likes messing around with his own pet rat. Hey, I bet he's got a tale or two to tell. And from time to time, all the family fancies a bit of TV dinner. Welcome to the Cooper family. And this is where they live. Yeah, let's see if they're in. Here we go. Press the doorbell. Must be in. Ah! Hello there. Right, you Remember, the, the Cooper rat. family have well, never the seen the recipes the and don't yet Hello, know they're about to cook up some top Tudor scoff. Great, lovely stuff. Lead me to that kitchen. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> Right, are you lot ready for today's challenge? Yes, yes. Love, yeah. Oh, lovely stuff, because <laughs> I've got in here, right, in these three envelopes, I have got a recipe. What you have to do, pick one of these envelopes, undo it, find out what you've got to cook. It could be a main course, it could be a pudding, whatever it is, you've got to go cook it and make yourself a top tuna treat, which is really nice to eat. Go on, all right, pick one, go on, pick one, pick, pick, pick. Lovely. OK, let's find out what I'm going to be doing today. <laughs> like this sort of stuff. But what are you doing, Sue? What are you doing? Uh, Elizabethan apple moist. What have you got there? A fruity chewed lamb. A set of all kinds of herbs. Sounds really good to me. I'll tell you what, you lot, go get cooking. But first of all, you've got to go wash your hands. Very important, that sort of thing. Off you go. <laughs> oh, I think I'll get out of the way. <laughs> We've already stuffed their kitchen with the right ingredients, so all they've got to do is to match what's in the fridge and cupboards to the recipes they've just picked out. And this is what they're each cooking. Abby's got the salad of all kinds of herbs. Uh, basically, it's a salad with watercress, parsley, lettuce and rocket. Ooh, I wonder what that is. Chives, some hard-boiled eggs and a bunch of flowers. Flowers? No, that can't be right. Matt's got the main dish, fruity Tudor lamb, which is stewed lamb steaks cooked with prunes, raisins, dates and currants, seasoned with cinnamon, ginger and nutmegs, oh, and a sprig or two of rosemary. And Sue, so their mum's doing the pudding, Elizabethan apple moise, which is apples stewed in a little water together with egg yolk, ginger and some rose water. All right, you lot ready to cook? Yes. And it only remains for me to say these following words. Readyeth, steadyeth, cooketh. <laughs> I love that one. Abby, what are you doing? Apparently, it's only the roses in this bunch of summer flowers that you can eat. Most flowers are a bit on the nasty side, and some of them are downright poisonous. With the cotton hanging out... So you can take them out. This cucumber is part of a Tudor dish, and that must mean they must have grown cucumbers in England. Ah. What I didn't know was that cucumbers were originally known as cowcumbers. Not surprisingly, Abby was having a bit of a struggle with some of the Tudor descriptions. Also, Matt didn't feel a prune at all measuring out the old dried fruits. <laughs> Sue kept bragging about how she'd got the easiest job with the Elizabethan apple moys. Just couldn't fail, she said. and everyone found the time for a sneak taste. Hey, don't blame me if it spoils your appetite. Hey, whilst they're busy, come with me under the table. Come on. Now, what Sue, Matt and Abby don't know is that I've called in a very special Tudor food expert to uh, judge their cooking. Now, she spends all year travelling around the country and she teaches all people what sort of things they used to eat and drink 400 years ago. Now, her name is Ruth Goodman and she should be here, well, in 10 minutes from now. <laughs> oh! <laughs> So, here we are, two minutes to go, and just time to set the table. OK, everybody, that's it. Time 
thumbs up. Let's find out how they did. Here we are. That's it. Bring the food over. Oh, now, I've got to admit, that does look good. That does look good. It's brilliant, doesn't it? Mm. Oh, speaking of brilliant, we've actually got an expert in to uh, actually find out how good your food is. Oh, so if we can have him, Miss Goodman, in you come. Oh, look at this roof. Good Hello. Hello. <laughs> look, I've even brought my own plates. Knives, plate plates, oh, napkins. Ruth had brought the lot. Tudor style. This smells good. It does smell good, doesn't it? Does it does smell good. I wouldn't mind having a bit of this. <laughs> <laughs> and here's what's on the table. First up, the main dish. Matt's fruity lamb stew served on a bread sop. Is it good? Mmm, it is good. Is it? Right. Well done. It's very good. Oh, yeah, we like the sound of this. Mmm. Let's try a bit of this nice. Next in line, okay. Abby's herb salad. Very good. Not too much oil. And finally, Sue's party piece, apple moise. You might have let it go a bit hot. You might just have scrambled it a little bit there. <sighs> oh, no, I've let the side down. And you, said you, had, and you said you had the simplest one. <laughs> 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 Tastes good, Mike. Well, that's all right. So, I mean, Mark's all right. I mean, is it a good mm, meal? It's a very good meal. Now, the thing is, uh, like, in that time, 400 years ago, this would this be considered quite a posh meal? Or... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, there's lots. Not only is there a lot of meat here, yeah. but also there's lots of ingredients here that have to be imported, brought in from abroad. And anything that has to be imported is an expensive ingredient. So Can I just ask as well, why does a married woman have two knives? Ah, because it is a married woman's duty to carve the meat at table. And if you have right. two knives, may I? Ask Please. You? you can hold it down with one and carve it right. with the other, and then take it to people's plates. So your husband gives them to you on your wedding day. That's nice of him. It is, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it marks you out as a married lady just as much as having a wedding ring. But enough of the chit-chat. After a couple of hours of cooking and no snacking, I was absolutely famished. Try this, because I've got to admit, this does smell very nice. I'm going to have a go. Mmm, that's good. Very nice. <laughs> it's very, it's very, I shouldn't talk with my mouth full, but this is really nice. This is really nice. Well, time for us now to go and eat, but I hope this has inspired you to do some serious history cookery. And if our Tudor treats have tickled your taste buds, you'll find the recipes and a whole lot more things to cook in the booklet which goes with this video. So you too can chew the food. <laughs> Get it? Chew the food. <laughs> Oh, chew the food! Oh, that cracks me up! <laughs>
Between now and the end of the programme, five separate pictures of kings and queens from English history will flash up on your screen. The game is to try and spot them all. Pause and rewind is definitely allowed, but only when you've watched the whole programme. Here, where did Caesar hide his armies? Up his sleeveys! <laughs> Not funny. The Big History Action Pack! From the roof of Dover Castle, you can see the landscape for miles, and sometimes you can even make out the coast of France just across the sea. In the past, England and France have shared a lot of their history, sometimes at war, sometimes through trade, good times and bad. Lots of us might know about Napoleon and the Battle of Waterloo, but how much do we really know about one event in 1066 which linked our history firmly to France? Well, I know that 1066 was when the Normans invaded England and that their leader was William the Conqueror and that he came from France, which is why I'm here in France to find out a bit about him. Look, I know it sounds stupid, but what I didn't realise is that the Normans came from here, in Normandy, and that William the Conqueror was originally Duke of Normandy, not King of France. So why did he invade England? I haven't got the foggiest need to find out. This is Falaise, the place he was born. But there aren't many clues about why he invaded England. This is a town called Caen in Normandy, where William the Conqueror lived. Still don't know why he became King of England, though. But this is Bayer, home of the Bayer Tapestry. The tapestry's over 70 metres long and around 900 years old. And they say it records the whole story in pictures. You wait here, I'll go check it out. <laughs> I've got it! I've got it! Kings, dukes, traitors, blood, bravery and boats, this story's got the lot! Once upon a time, there was a king called Edward. King Edward of England. In France, there was a duke called William. William, Duke of Normandy. Now, before Edward became King of England, he'd lived here, in Normandy. Some say he preferred Normandy to England. Now, Edward and William were cousins. Well, distant cousins, actually. Now, there's someone else in this story, Harold, King Edward's brother-in-law. But King Edward had no heir. I don't mean he was going bald, I mean he didn't have any children. The question was, who would be King of England when Edward died? Would it be Harold, his brother-in-law, William, his cousin, or someone else? The tapestry says that King Edward sent Harold to Normandy. While Harold was here, William persuaded him into promising to help William become King of England after Edward died. So, back goes Harold to England. And soon after he got there, Edward, the king, died. So, who do you think crowns himself King of England? You've guessed it, Harold, after everything he said to William. King Harold, crowned in Westminster Abbey. And is William angry about the promise that Harold broke? You bet he is. So angry that he gets together an army. A serious army. Horses, weapons, armour, archers, food and drink, the lot. And set sail for England. When William arrives, he sets up his army near Hastings. Harold, with his army, rushes down to challenge him. October the 14th, 1066. The Battle of Hastings. William, Duke of Normandy, on one side, Harold, King of England, on the other. Vicious slaughter all day. Axes, arrows, cavalry. The tapestry shows it all. The battlefield drenched in blood. Who won? Well, King Harold was killed, wounded by an arrow, hacked to death by swords. 
his troops defeated. William triumphant. Now, William was both Duke of Normandy and King of England. The Battle of Hastings, an invasion which changed England from Saxon to Norman and altered its history forever. So there you are, 1066, the whole story. How and why the Normans invaded England nearly a thousand years ago. Or rather, how William the Conqueror saw it according to the Bayer Tapestry. And I'll tell you what, if you get the chance, come and see it for yourself. You can also visit the site of the Battle of Hastings. It's near Battle Abbey in Sussex. The big, 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 <laughs> big history action bag. R is for Romans. Julius Caesar came to England with his army in 55 and 54 BC. Britain was part of the Roman Empire, using the Latin language and coinage for almost 400 years. Yep, yep. Why is the British Museum so like an old frying pan? Because it's full of ancient Greece. <laughs> S is for Shakespeare. William Shakespeare's plays were often performed in round open air wooden theatres. The Globe Theatre beside the River Thames in London is built just like a theatre in Shakespeare's time. Born in 1564, Shakespeare was hugely popular with his audiences. He wrote historical plays about English kings and their wars, tragedies and some cracking comedies. T is for trams. Trams got horse-drawn carriages off city streets and made it easier to transport large numbers of people because wheels running on rails were more efficient. Early trams were pulled by horses, but later ones used steam engines and then electric motors. In the last few years, trams have returned to some English cities. And welcome back, I say. A lot of what we know about English history comes from what's been written down. Mike Corbishley has been dipping into the world of print. The Big History Guide to Puzzling Through the Papers. You know, over the years, your local newspaper whether it's daily or weekly, has quietly been recording England's history, perhaps without even realising it. A back copy of a newspaper or magazine that's 10, 20 or even 100 years old is an extraordinary scrapbook of the past and, for a quick read of history, a bit of fun. Tip number one, if access to the nearest newspaper archive looks a bit tricky, don't be put off, just get in touch with your local library. Genuine old newspapers can be hard to track down, but libraries, record offices, and sometimes the newspaper's own archives tend to keep what's been published on computer or microfilm. Next, choose the date of a memorable event within the last hundred years and look up that day's newspaper. People tend to hang on to newspapers and magazines published on special days, so you're more likely to find what you want. Sounds odd, but once you've got something to read, skip the news stories and flick through to the adverts and the letters page. Adverts tell you what things used to cost and what people like to buy and sell. Letters to the editor tell you what people thought and felt about things going on in the world. Finally, here's the crunch, get another newspaper, this time one that's just a few days old, and compare now's with yesterday's. Pretty quickly, you'll get a sense of the differences between past and present, especially how science and technology have changed the way we do things. But don't forget, what's printed in any newspaper is just one point of view. So, can we always believe what we read? If you fancy your chances on the newspaper trail, here's a few dates to research. Late July 1966, the year England won the World Cup. Early May 1945, the end of World War II. Late January 1901, the death of Queen Victoria. December 1980, the year John Lennon of the Beatles got shot. And in case you think you've been fooled, news usually hits the front page the day after it happens. A to Z of English history. U is for 
universities. Universities started in England when Oxford University was founded more than 800 years ago. V is for Vikings. Vikings came by sea from the countries we now call Scandinavia. That's Denmark, Sweden and Norway. They were explorers, traders and settlers in spite of their traditional reputation as violent raiders. York and Dublin were great Viking trading centres. At the centre of Dover Castle is its medieval keep. Inside are fantastic presentations. One is about Henry VIII and the other makes you feel you're part of the castle while it's under attack. The siege experience here at Dover Castle is acted out in sounds and pictures with some amazing effects. But you know, you can spend your weekends getting a lot closer to the action. Janet Gershley went to visit a modern medieval family. This is a living history weekend and there are thousands of people here in historical costumes and they've got camps, they've got fires, they've got the right food, they're in battle, they've got the lot. But I'm here to tell you how you can become a reenactor. But firstly, what is a reenactor? Mad they may be, but reenactors are folks who dress up and pretend to live in the past. They even do it in families. I mean, this is our first season, uh, and a couple of weekends ago, somebody new turned up, uh, and we were able to offer a piece of our kit that we've got spare, and everybody, you know, in about five minutes, he was kitted out and able to go out and, and join in, which is what's really good, you know, everybody's very friendly and in together. And it's not just grown-ups who have all the fun. Simon is our drummer and leads us out onto the field of battle, uh, drumming away, and it's good, and as he gets older, he'll be out on the battlefield with us fighting as well. Simon, what do your friends think of all this? Do you tell them at school? They say I'm crazy. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> and what do you say when they say you're crazy? Well, it's fun, so I'm tough love. Reenactment groups cover most centuries, so time travel to where you fancy. But if it's like joining a club, how much dosh do you need? I mean, are there subscriptions? Do you have to sort of pay into somebody? Or you do. I mean, we, we pay, um, I think it's a nominal fee to cover sort of uh, insurance and so on. It's not a big sum of money. Subs paid, now clothes. Every garment an exact copy of its historical original, handmade. And then you've got your sewing kit out, as you do. As you do, yes. And, and we uh, uh, got stuck in, really. <laughs> and do you even have to have the right sort of shoes? Yes. There's a few people over the country that actually make them, and they're made the way they would have been made. Right, so you uh, can't originally. sort of sit so down and know. stitch them? <clears throat> Those things you have to go and buy. How much do you reckon that pair of shoes cost you? £100, but you can get them for less. Mm. These are extremely comfortable and will last me a good few seasons. What about underwear? That's left up to the individual. Oh, is it? <laughs> it is. Okay, I just need to know that. The ladies. <laughs> if you get stuck with historical accuracy, there is backup. Well, the household we joined sent us a booklet and it had all, a list of all the rules in it, um, such as no makeup, um, all the clothes you have to have on, um, when the public are in, what you can't have out on show. That means watches, wellies, and packets of walkers stashed away in the tent. What about the rough stuff? Now, I want to know, I want to know that when you go on battle, OK, are there rules and regulations that says, Philip, you have to die now and there's no good taking a long time over it, you've got to go? The overall battles often are choreographed. I mean, big battles like Tewkesbury and Bosworth, obviously, we can't change the outcome. Um, but within that, within the actual bill line, no, you fight, uh, and if you get hit, uh, depending on the sort of padding and armour you've got, um, you'll go down or you acknowledge a hit. I mean, it's, and if you're getting it wrong, if you're not going down, then the hits come harder and harder, and eventually uh, <laughs> they you get will go you. down, yes. <laughs> Even without taking part in the punch-ups, it's not that difficult to get started. OK, so family watching, thinking, yes, this is a fabulous idea, but basically, how do I do it and what do I do? The easiest thing to do is actually to go along to an event, and they're fairly well publicised. Certainly English Heritage uh, have a number of events all over the country. Go along, come sit around the campfire, have a chat with them, talk about what they need to do, look at the kit and think about whether you want to do it, and take it from there. Go along, enjoy it and have a go. Denise, any tips? 
Brush up on your packing skills. Right. <laughs> and your sewing skills, I And reckon. your sewing skills, yeah. <laughs> and so I'd like to know what's for lunch. Uh, it's pottage again, I'm afraid. Oh, Lord. <laughs> okay. It's always pottage. It's a vegetable stew thickened with rice. Right. Well, I think I'll have a double portion of that. Thank you very much indeed. Whatever the weather, and believe me, it's sluiced down the evening after I visited them, reenactors like the Barnes family live whole summer weekends as a full on historical family. And they just love it. To be honest, this is not for me because I love my duvet and hot shower far too much. But I have learned that you don't have to be a great historian to join in as a reenactor, and it is a brilliant way to learn history with your family and just enjoy yourself. To find out where you can see reenactment groups, call English Heritage and ask for the special events leaflet. And there's more about reenactors in our big history booklet. <laughs> what English kings were good at fractions? Henry VIII and Richard III. <laughs> w is for watermills. Watermills were used to grind grain in England during Roman times. A flowing river or stream was a free source of power to drive machinery for spinning, weaving or metalworking. That's why lots of old mills and factories are sited besides rivers. No wonder they made a splash. X is for xylenite. Xylenite was an early form of celluloid plastic used to imitate tortoiseshell, ivory and horn and to make the first photographic film. The only problem with celluloid was that it caught fire easily. And now here's our big history guide to some great days out with English heritage. Medieval castles often have several centuries of history rolled into one site. The views can be spectacular, and you're certain to see towers, chambers and walkways with some amazing fortifications. If you fancy finding out how people used to live, try a country house. Lots of them have really atmospheric displays, so you can see kitchens, bedrooms and bathrooms full of bits and pieces from the past, and looking like the people who live there have just popped out. To go way back in history, take a trip to an ancient site. Just how and why did they build those massive stone circles more than 5,000 years ago? And what was it like to be a Roman soldier in a freezing fort on a far corner of Hadrian's Wall? Lots of monuments have audio tours, activity centres and sometimes special events. So don't hang about, get out there and grab yourself a slice of the history trail. More information about what's where in the Big History booklet. Y is for yard. A yard is one of the traditional English ways of measuring. Three grains of barley laid side by side make an inch. Twelve inches make a foot, a human foot including the big toe. And three feet make one yard, and often some very smelly socks. What king liked to look after his army's feet? William the Corn Curer! Corn Curer! <laughs> Remember the name. It's Humphrey Hartley. Hysterical, historical humour! <laughs> Z is for zebra crossing. The winking orange globes which mark pedestrian crossings are called Belisha beacons. They were named after a man called Leslie Hoare Belisha, who introduced them in 1934. I call him Flash. Well, that's just about it from the Big History Action Pack. I hope you've enjoyed it and maybe picked up a few tips on getting into your own adventures in history. From Dover Castle, bye.
history action pack. The middle-sized history action pack. As opposed to the very, very small history action pack.